Hello, happy people. Uh, thank you for tuning in to uh, my video in the Hello World series. Uh, my name is Will Blair. I'm a PhD student at the University of Arkansas working under Professor Andrew Ray. Uh, I'll be defending my thesis in the spring of 2024. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some results from my recent paper, An Atomic Representation of Party Classes of Solutions to Non-Homogeneous Cauchy Riemann Equation. Uh, I'm going to start from some very, uh, you know, basic classic ideas and uh, build up the motivation to the, uh, the results uh, that I show in this paper. Uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for HAPPY. This is a fantastic uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, to let other people know about the things that I've been thinking about. And I've really enjoyed seeing uh, other videos that have already been posted. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's begin. So this is just a little bit of a breakdown of how things will go. Uh, and let's start with just some basic notation to make sure that we're all on the same page. So by D, I will always mean the unit disk in the complex plane. Uh, CK, C0, Alpha, and LP are going to mean exactly what you think they are. Uh, we're going to be working in a single complex variable, so the differential operators that uh, we need to know about would be partial partial Z and partial partial Z bar in particular. We're going to be using this one, uh, partial partial Z bar, uh, quite a bit. And we will use the usual definition that a holomorphic function is a function on the disk that satisfies uh, the cauchy riemann equation, which is that its partial z-bar derivative is equal to zero. And we will call the space of holomorphic functions h and b. Now, I'm someone who thinks about things from uh, you know, more of a complex analysis point of view. Uh, and certainly in complex analysis, in particular complex analysis of a single complex variable, uh, we think a lot about holomorphic functions. So why do we care so much about holomorphic functions? Uh, it's a pretty natural question. And I think the, the easiest answer to give is that they are almost the nicest class of functions you can possibly imagine. And we could spend uh, much longer than you would like to watch this video talking about just exactly why holomorphic functions are uh, the nicest class of functions, almost the nicest class of functions you can imagine. But it begs the question, why am I saying almost? What is missing from the picture when we're talking about holomorphic functions on the disk? Boundary values. A general generic holomorphic function does not necessarily have boundary values, even though it has uh, you know, quite a bit of very nice properties and, 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 and structure. They don't necessarily have boundary values, and that's a great loss. Immediately, we're, we're unable to do things like solve boundary value problems. Uh, so we would like to have a, a natural, specific type of hypothesis that we can immediately apply and say, okay, if our function, our holomorphic functions satisfy this condition, uh, we know they have boundary values. And from my perspective, the correct one would be to consider the classic holomorphic Hardy spaces. So just as a reminder, for P, a positive real number, uh, holomorphic Hardy spaces on the unit disk are those holomorphic functions which have finite HP norm. HP norm being defined uh, by this quantity here. So now, why is this the correct class of functions to look at? Well, holomorphic Hardy space functions have radial boundary values, and those radial boundary values are, in fact, in the corresponding uh, LP spaces on the circle. Not only do the holomorphic Cardi space functions converge to their boundary values along radial paths, they converge to them along non-tangential paths, which is to say a path contained in a Prevalov's ice cream cone, also known as a Stoll's region or non-tangential approach region. Uh, not only do the Hardy space functions converge to their boundary values non-tangentially, they also converge to them in the corresponding uh, LP norm. If we narrow our focus to what I will be calling P large, P greater than one, uh, the functions in those holomorphic Hardy spaces, HP for P greater than one, are representable uh, pointwise by the Poisson integral of 
their non-tangential boundary back. So we have this nice integral representation uh, for our function point-wise with respect to the boundary back. Now, this paints the picture that for P large, things are very nice. We have boundary values in a nice class. Lebesgue spaces for P large are very nice function classes. We have a representation formula. But if we if we look between the lines here for P small, and when I say P small, I'm going to mean P less than one. Well, for P less than one, the LP spaces are not great function spaces. So having a boundary value in an LP space for P small is not a particularly desirable thing. And we're going to lose our, our integral rep our Poisson integral representation here for P small. So there's certainly still more to say uh, about this situation for P small. And to pursue that idea, we're actually going to need a different notion of a boundary value. So for F, a function on the disk, we'll say that F has a boundary value in the sense of distribution and denote it F sub P if for every test function, uh, this limit where we're integrating the function around circles of radius r against our test function, and then taking the limit as r goes to 1, if that limit exists, that defines a distribution. Uh, we will call it f sub b, and we will say that this distribution f sub b is the boundary value in the sense of distributions of f. And sometimes I'm going to say distributional boundary value, and I, that means exactly the same thing. One thing to point out, if this is the first time you've thought about these uh, kinds of objects, is that just because a function has a non-tangential boundary value and a boundary value in the sense of distribution, uh, there's, there's no reason to believe a priori that those two uh, objects agree in, in, in any meaningful way. Uh, sometimes they do, but, but that would be uh, a big conclusion to jump to. <clears throat> All right, so... This next theorem is a theorem from a paper by Gustavo Hoffner and George Hooney from 2008. It gives us a lot of information about the relationship between holomorphic functions and distributional boundary values. Uh, it says for a holomorphic function, the following three conditions are equivalent. The first one being that that holomorphic function has a boundary value in the sense of distributions. The second condition being that those holomorphic functions are point-wise representable by this distributional pairing of the boundary value in the sense of distributions against the Poisson kernel. And the third condition being that F has tempered growth at the boundary, which is to say it satisfies this kind of a growth condition. Now you'll see in my paper, and right here I'm referencing Hoffner and Hooney's 08 paper, they proved this directly in their 08 paper. Uh, however, since writing my paper, I found that uh, Emil Straba in 1984 wrote a paper where he actually uh, proved this, this result along with uh, some more general results and, and some, some really rich uh, uh, results in that paper. Uh, so, so you can certainly find this in Straba 84, and that would be, that would be a, a more correct reference. Now, this is a result just about holomorphic functions. How does this fit into uh, this, this picture we're trying to paint about Hardy spaces? Well, in their 08 paper, Hoffner and Tooney showed that the holomorphic Hardy spaces are of tempered growth at the boundary, meaning that they satisfy that third condition in the last theorem. So they do have boundary values in the sense of distributions. Uh, so now, holomorphic Hardy space functions have boundary values in the sense of distributions for all people. So this gives us a, a, a object to work with for small p that is maybe something that's a little bit uh, you know, nicer to be thinking about than, say, small p Lebesgue spaces. Uh, now, as the title mentioned, we're going to be talking about atomic decomposition, so we need some atoms. Now, let's fix our p small. That means a positive p that's less than or equal to 1. So that's really the only time we're worried about atomic decompositions. Uh, for a small p, a measurable function A defined on the circle is a p atom if the support of A is contained in an arc of the circle, which could be the whole circle. Uh, the size of A is controlled by the size of its support, and A satisfies uh, the k moment condition, which means that it satisfies this equation for k that satisfies this inequality. Uh, Certainly, if you've studied, uh, you know, the, the real variable Hardy spaces, 
in the way that they are described in, say, Stein's harmonic analysis book, this, this definition will feel very familiar. It's very analogous to that type of definition, just moved on to the circle. Uh, and for this situation, we will also need uh, those constant functions which are bounded by one. Now, in their 08 paper, Hoffman and Huni showed that the holomorphic Hardy space functions, uh, F and HP for P small, not only have boundary values in the sense of distribution, F sub B, but those boundary values in the sense of distributions are representable by an atomic decomposition. So, we have a nice way of talking about the boundary values of small P Hardy spaces in the holomorphic setting. Now's the time that I have to uh, confess that after all of this talking about the, the niceness of holomorphic functions, I don't actually study holomorphic functions. What I'm interested in uh, are solutions to non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equations, those functions which are not uh, holomorphic. You know, you know, a quick way of figuring out that a function is not holomorphic is take a z-bar derivative that's not identically zero, uh, then you don't have a holomorphic function. And so studying non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equations is a very direct way to interact with uh, those kinds of functions. Now, when studying these kinds of functions, not non-holomorphic functions, I think uh, a very good place to start is to go back to the classic cauchy pompier theorem. So the classic cauchy pompier theorem, to remind you, says that for any function that's continuous on the disk, or C1 on the disk, excuse me, and continuous up to the boundary, that can be represented by this integral equation. Where note, if f happens to be a holomorphic function, the second integral on the right-hand side vanishes, and we just have the classic Cauchy integral formula. Uh, whether or not f is a holomorphic function, if it is, if we have a continuous on the circle function in our first integral here, that makes this first integral a holomorphic function. So even in this setting, if say we were to take the z-bar derivative of both sides of this equation, on the left-hand side, we would have partial f, partial z-bar. This first integral vanishes because it's a holomorphic function. And we're left with the z-bar derivative of the second integral where we can note that the left-hand side of this new equation is exactly the numerator of the integrand. What this tells us is that this second integral acts as a right inverse to the z-bar derivative in this setting. Now, we're going to want to investigate more general settings than this one for, for classes of function f, which are much rougher than uh, the one in the classic cauchy pompey theorem. Uh, so let's so let's see that, uh, you know, how this kind of an integral interacts with these rougher classes of functions. Uh, and now this, the next uh, few slides are going to have several theorems on them that can all be found in uh, Ian Bekowitz's book, Generalized Analytic Functions, or Sergey Klementov's book, Boundary Properties of Generalized Analytic Functions. I didn't go through and notate each one of those, so uh, uh, but those those would be the references for these results. They're not mine, and uh, I'll, I'll have those references listed at the end of the video. Uh, so first, let's let's define an operator T that, when applied to functions on the disk, is just exactly that second integral from the cauchy pompey uh, formula, where the integrand now is that function f. This, this way that we can uh, talk about specifically that second integral uh, in the cauchy pompey theorem, because that's the one that we, we want to get uh, a little bit better handle on here. Now, our first theorem listed here for an f an integrable function. That's all we need is f an integrable function, and then our tf, in fact, exists. That integral converges on the plane, uh, is a holomorphic function off of the closed disk, and vanishes at infinity. So for just f an integrable function, uh, tf is relatively well-behaved. Uh, again, for f merely an integrable function, that weak z-bar derivative of tf is exactly f. So even in this scenario of f being merely an integrable function on the disk, uh, this integral, which has shown up in the cauchy pompey theorem that we're now calling t, uh, 
is still serving as a right inverse to our z bar derivative. And we're going to make great use out of that. Uh, now, we've been talking about boundary value, so we need to know a little bit about what's happening uh, on the boundary with respect to this, this new object, TF, that, that we're investigating. So let's say our function f on the disk is, say, in a Lebesgue space LQ for, let's say, q greater than 2 now, a, a little bit nicer function. Then TF, in fact, is a holder continuous function up to the boundary. So in particular, on the boundary, TF is a holder continuous function. Uh, if, say, f is in a Lebesgue space LQ where q is between 1 and 2, in particular, it's greater than 1, uh, then TF is in a Lebesgue space on the interior and has a boundary value, which is in the Lebesgue space L gamma on the circle, uh, where gamma is, is just any number satisfying this inequality. In particular, gamma is greater than 1. It's better than an integrable function. For F and LQ, Q greater than 1, not only do we have that TF has an L gamma boundary value, but in fact, TF converges to that boundary value in the corresponding L gamma norm. So what we know here is that uh, so long as F is in a Lebesgue space a little bit better than integrable, LQ, say Q greater than 1, Q could be 1 plus epsilon, we have boundary values. TF has boundary values uh, and in fact has a lot of the same kind of characteristics here uh, to our classic Holomorphic Hardy space boundary values, in that we have this convergence uh, even in uh, the corresponding Lebesgue space norm. So now, what can we say so far? Let's say if we define a function w, which is equal to df, this is a solution to the non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equation, partial w, partial z bar, equal to f. Why? Well, if we take the z bar derivative of tf, that returns f. T is acting like a right inverse operator on the disk so long as f is at least an integrable function. And in fact, this characterizes all solutions to this kind of PDE. So say f is an integrable function, every solution of the non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equation, partial w, partial z bar equal to f, has the form w equal to holomorphic function plus tf, where uh, our var phi here is a holomorphic function. What this lets us know is if we want to study solutions to these non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equations, we're stuck with this TF part. You know, solutions can be no better than TF can be. And if we're wanting to, you know, do a sharper analysis of, say, certain, you know, subclasses of solutions, the holomorphic part's really where uh, say additional hypotheses can uh, have an effect on uh, these functions that we're looking at. And this leads directly to these classes of functions that I've been studying. So let's let's define what I'm talking about here. So for P a positive real number at an integrable function, we're going to denote by HPF that set of functions uh, complex value functions on the disk that solve the non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equation, partial w, partial z bar equal to f, and have finite HP norm. Note this is just the classical uh, HP norm from the classical holomorphic Hardy spaces. I'm certainly not the first person to think about uh, classes of functions like these. Uh, for example, uh, Sergey Klementov has studied these kinds of classes of functions when f is a linear combination of the solution function and its complex conjugate. Those non-homogeneous cauchy riemann equations are called the Vecchio equations. Uh, and Sergey Klementov spent a lot of time uh, you know, studying those. Uh, when the right-hand side is a measurable function bounded in modulus by 1 times the z derivative of the solution function, that's called a Beltrami equation. And there's been uh, you know, quite a few people that have studied uh, these classes of functions in that context. Um, or if, say, it's a measurable function bounded in modulus by 1 times uh, the z bar derivative of the conjugate, complex conjugate of the solution function. Those are called conjugate Beltrami equations. Uh, and, there, and there's a host of people that have studied 
uh, those in this context of also having finite HP norm. Uh, and, and, and please feel free to let me know if you'd like some references uh, to those to those kinds of papers because there's quite a few of them. Where where I'm doing something that's a little bit different is that I'm studying these functions which are solutions in this you know, most general situation here. But the right-hand side is uh, perhaps just an integrable function uh, without, without specifying a specific structure or not. And so it's with respect to this, this very general class of, uh, of, of hardy type functions, uh, you know, where we're, we're satisfying a PDE and we have finite HP norm uh, that, that I have some results to tell you about. Uh, so the first one here, we're going to require P to be a positive real number, less than or equal to one, and F is in a Lebesgue space L cubed to greater than one. Q could be one plus epsilon. I just need a little bit better than integrable. Then every function W in the corresponding HPF, generalized Hardy class, has a representation W equal to var P plus TF. Well, we already know that because W is a solution to a non-homogeneous Cauchy-Riemann equation. What's new here? Var P is not only holomorphic, var P is in the corresponding holomorphic Hardy space, where P is exactly the same P uh, as above. Now, since we know that our function is a holomorphic Hardy space function plus TF, of course we have TF here, uh, holomorphic Hardy space functions have distributional boundary values. We saw that from the result from Hoffner and Huni's paper. TF certainly has distributional boundary values also. So at W being a sum of things that have a boundary value in, sense, in the sense of distributions, W also has a boundary value in the sense of distributions. Let's maybe call it W sub B, which is exactly the sum of the boundary values in the sense of distributions of bar P and TF. Well, bar phi being a holomorphic Hardy space function, its boundary value in the sense of distributions is representable by an atomic decomposition. TF's boundary value in the sense of distribution, since TF is an integrable function, which has an integrable boundary value, and TF converges to that integrable boundary value uh, in the L1 norm as a consequence of the results that we just looked at, that boundary value in the sense of distributions exactly agrees with uh, that boundary value function from the results. And we know by the previous results from Bekua and Klimentov's book uh, that that function, if you know, depending on what class F lives in, uh, we know more about that, that boundary value of TF. In particular, if say F is just an L cubed cube greater than one, then that boundary value is in an L gamma space, in particular gamma being greater than one the better than integrable function on the circle. And if say F is in LQ or Q is greater than two, well, then we know that TF sub B is in fact a colder continuous function. This lets us know that the boundary values of the functions in these generalized Hardy classes are representable by an atomic decomposition plus an error term where the error term is a relatively nice function, even in, even in the, the roughest case that we can consider here. Note, if say f is identically zero, then we're just back in the situation of holomorphic functions and we exactly recover uh, the classical results about holomorphic Hardy spaces. Uh, and this gives us this gives us a way of considering these boundary values of the very general uh, Hardy class. Now, it would be very natural at this point to say, okay, we have this nice representation. Well, what can we do with it? Well, let's see. So let's remind ourselves that for an integrable function on the circle, the Hilbert transform on the circle is given by this equation. And thanks to Marcel Ries, we know that the Hilbert transform is a continuous operator on the LP spaces P greater than one. Uh, now let's call HPAT. Uh, let's call that 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 subset of the distributions on the circle HPAT uh, for all of those distributions that have an atomic decomposition. This HPAT is just this purely atomic 
uh, class of distributions on the circle. In their 08 paper, Hoffman and Huni showed that the Hilbert transform is a continuous operator on this, this subset of distributions on the circle. Now, if we consider that collection of distributional boundary values of a specific HPF class of functions, and let's maybe call them HPF sub B, so long as P is small and F is in the big space L Q Q greater than one, that collection of, considering that collection of distributional boundary values corresponding to that HPF space, the Hilbert transform is a continuous operator uh, on that class of distribution. Now, to prove this, essentially, you just appeal to linearity. Hoffman and Huni showed that Hilbert transform is a continuous operator on the atomic decomposition part. Marcel Ries showed that the Hilbert transform is a continuous operator on you know, the L gamma gamma greater than one uh, part of those distributions. And then you essentially put it together by linear. And so this, this lets us know that these generalized Hardy classes are another class of functions, another small p class of functions, where the boundary values uh, are a place where the Hilbert transform is a continuous operator. It gives us another class of distributions associated with a small p uh, function space, and, and uh, this ends up being a very analogous type result to the kinds of things that we would expect from the, you know, the real the study of real variable Hardy spaces. All right, folks, thank you for uh, watching this video. Let me talk a little bit about some of the references here at the end. Number one here is the paper uh, of mine where you can find the details for the uh, results that we just talked about. Uh, number three, I want to point out is a little bit of a, a more obscure reference, but it's a pa the paper by Gustavo Hoffner and George Cooney that I've referenced a few times already in this talk, if you'd like to take a look at that. Uh, number four is the book that I referenced by Sergey Klementov, Boundary Properties of Generalized Analytic Functions. Um, it is in Russian, um, but if that's something that you're... Uh, the kinds of results that are in that book are something that you'd be interested in talking about, uh, send me an email. Uh, number six is that paper by Neil Straba that I that I mentioned earlier. It's a fantastic paper if you're interested about distributional boundary values like I am. Um, it, it, it's a really fantastic paper. And you should check it out. Uh, and seven is Beckwith's classic book, Generalized Analytic Functions, which is very much the starting place uh, that one should jump in on if they're interested in non-homogeneous post riemann equations, in particular the Vecchio equation, uh, but also in general. Uh, so folks, if uh, you found these results interesting or would like to learn a little bit more about the other things that I've been thinking about uh, outside of atomic decomposition, uh, please click on the QR code that'll take you to my website where you can find the archive links to my papers and my email address. Feel free to let me know if uh, you want to talk about any of these things. And I'm very happy that you watched the video. And, and thank you again to the, the organizers of uh, Happy for uh, this platform to speak about my work. Thank you.